Okay, with the passing of Robert Town, we figured it's time to talk about one of his uh, movies that he wrote. Yeah, so we're going to be breaking down. You know, a lot of people are going to probably talk their Chinatowns or, or maybe Shampoo. their Mission Impossibles, which, you know, you yeah. can check out on our Patreon by joining. Yeah. But we're going to talk about one that I don't think gets talked about that much. Uh -uh. The Last Detail. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm yep. Navy Shore Patrol Officer Kyle Gothy from GoatFilmReviews.com. I'm Nick for the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for watching, thanks for finding us, and for our loyal fans. Sincerely, thank you. Thank you for continuing to support the show. Another way you can support the show, join the Patreon. we got some great content, great deals, and an opportunity for you to pick up another movie, for, a rubber town movie for us to review in mm -hmm. future episodes. With, of course, a shout out to you as well. Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check out that webpage for critics reviews as well as ours. And today we're talking about the last detail. Mm. So Badass Badusky and yeah, Mule that. Mulhall, two Navy Shore Patrol officers, have been tasked with delivering a pilfering seaman to Portsmouth. And they decide to spend their per diem in their last few days giving him just a good time. So I... Really appreciative of Robert Town. I grew up in the 70s and 80s and 90s, so I know about his stories. I believe one of the things that Robert Town is really good at is dialogue writing. Mm. Not so much of his overall story arc, but dialogue writing. And I think if you're interested in screenwriting, check out Robert Town's all his movies, especially for dialogue. Yeah, and especially the ones that he worked with Jack Nicholson on. Because I think that <laughs> yeah. Jack yeah. Nicholson knew how to read that stuff. It's kind of like Sam Jackson and Tarantino. It's like he knew how to read those lines and make them real. Yeah. One thing a lot of people think about when you're talking about writing dialogue is people think, oh, this dialogue's great because it's real. That's not true. Real people talking is boring. You have to find kind of that middle ground between realistic talking yeah. and movie talking where it's like realistic enough but still entertaining. And I think that's what he does with his writing here is these are fully fleshed out lived in characters who we want to experience time with, but they're still over the top. Yeah, I think uh, Jack Nicholson's character doesn't really blow up a lot, but it has the potential, every opportunity to blow up. And it's how he says things. It's how he maneuvers. The whole time in the hotel room, you thought he's just gonna eventually just trash it. Mm -hmm. But it's that way of delivery that it's a staple that we will see for Jack Nicholson throughout his career. And I think this is the movie that cemented that we appreciate it and expect from all of his acting afterwards. Yeah, I think there's a lot of what he's doing kind of before this film, which is a little bit more toned down. It's a little bit more relaxed. You know, he just finished, was it Drive, he said? which had Robert Town involved with that as well. He'd just yeah. gotten done with that film. And then when he got a hold of this book and was told to adapt it, he actually adapted it with specificity for Jack Nicholson, either to direct or to act in it. Yeah. So, of course, it stars Jack Nicholson and then Otis. Otis uh, Young. Yeah, who eventually became a pastor after this movie. Yeah. Um, he kind of has and then, that way. <laughs> and you um, are supposed to, as a detail, transport a, very, a kleptomaniac, played by Randy, babyface Randy Quaid, mm -hmm. uh, across the port to jail in Portsmouth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, interesting fact about Otis Young, you know, you mentioned he became a, a pastor after this film, but he yeah. actually wasn't going to be in this film. It was actually Rupert Cross who was originally cast as mule but he had to drop out after he got a cancer diagnosis he was given the opportunity do really? you want to continue making the film or do you want to leave he chose to take some personal time and so otis young was brought in very very late and that's why the film was actually one of the reasons why it was shot chronologically is that they had brought in a number of people kind of late to the proceedings okay and they wanted to not kind of mess with them as they were putting together a film very much like the Odyssey, you bounce to town to town and you get adapted. Very much of kind of that kind of a story arc nature. It's not so much a military movie, but it's also just about these two people. And what are you supposed to do with your prisoner the whole time? Well, he's going to prison. Let's show him a good time as we're doing it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you got some cash. You got a couple of days. You, know you got a per diem. Say, right. You know? yeah. <laughs> and their, their initial idea was to spend it all on themselves anyway. So it's, it's <laughs> almost like they had a real quick Scrooge moment of let's, let's buy the giant turkey, you know, for Christmas where they're just going to give this kid a good time knowing that, to be yeah. honest, the, the I really hope that this didn't happen, but going to jail f for eight years and dishonorable discharge for $40 worth of theft that you didn't even get, I would hope that somebody would treat me to a nice entertaining time too. <laughs> right, yeah. I think one of the things the best about the writing of it, especially mm -hmm. when you're a writer, is how each character kind of leaves an impression on other characters. Yeah. And you can see um, Otis's young and Jack Nicholson's characters leave an impression 
on Randy Cade's character. Not character. Not to mention he leaves an impression on them. They actually lighten up a little bit. Yeah, and they actually kind of influence each other because Jack Nicholson, he's the one in charge, but he's also like the hot headed one. And Otis yeah. Young is the one who's kind of trying to stay by the book. You know, we've all had that before where like the person who's in charge of us is the one that's kind of like driving us away from what the simple route would be, the easy route. Um, and I think they imprint a little bit on each other too. They're kind of forced to. Yeah, and you get the early 70s where it feels like a documentary kind of tone to it. Mm -hmm. It feels like you're seeing it as it happens. We did a lot of that in the early 70s and eventually we'll spill out into French Connection. But I think that's the key to it. It feels authentic to like you're witnessing as it happens. Yeah, and I think that's where the film it really finds this comfortable place that's dead center between a road trip movie and a hangout movie. And those two movies I, ideas yeah. are generally yeah. pretty similar. It's just a road trip stops at more places, whereas a hangout is usually at a few kind of close by. Um, but this movie does find that the hangoutness and the road movie part of it actually work pretty well together. Um, and you get a little bit of, of what kind of elevates both of them in that none of the scenes, if you pulled one scene out of the movie... Yeah. wouldn't change the general direction of it. No. But it's kind of like uh, wearing down these you know, these, these stones until you get down. Every single scene presses in on them a little bit more. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you don't get the feeling that these characters will ever change, but the experience actually benefits everybody. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a nugget of something that's, that might alter their lives, but not, a, not enough of it that's going to change. I mean, Jack Nicholson's character, even once they leave, they're all complaining about this detail again. You know, him and, uh, and yeah. Otis Young's characters have After the job's done, they're still bitching about unchanged. it. Yeah. yeah. I'm done with um, this detail. But you hope that there's a nugget of something that they learned, something that's mm -hmm. impacted them, and sometimes even just having a good time. You know, and they, they, did, they did enjoy their time with, uh, with uh, Meadows. You know? Right. Meadows. I always, they always say, you got to see the character's name right enough times and they say metal's just the right enough time <laughs> the other interesting aspect to watch this movie is you get a lot of young stars before they're famous so Nancy Allen makes an appearance in mm -hmm. here you have Gilda Radner makes an appearance in here yeah. uh, I'm missing another one uh, Carol Kane Carol Kane who, was the um, young, yeah. I, I feel bad because she's credited in the film as young whore um <laughs> You know, which is, is basically how, you know, a lot of com conversations Right, go. we come a long way from characterizing people from the 70s. Yeah, yeah it certainly yeah. isn't the way I would have characterized her character, but I also, yeah. I do like that she is seen, she is seen in kind of an angelic light from Randy Quaid's perspective, from Meadows' perspective. Yeah. She's not mistreated. She's not, you know. No, but Randy Quaid's character, like, that she actually fell in love with him. Yeah. 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 Dude, dude. Dude. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of people would think that though. <laughs> right, and that's that's wonderful writing of how you this this boyish look has no miles, uh, you know, has no mileage out in the real world. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. and we also have uh, uh, kind of a young uh, Michael Moriarty in the film as well. He plays the guy. At oh, at the end, right? Thing. Yeah, yeah. And it took me a second to realize because I always I always remember Michael Moriarty with more wrinkles. Um. <laughs> and they cover for him because mm -hmm. they're like, why is he beat up? And they cover, like, did he try to run away? They don't want to add any more years to a sentence. Yeah. And they're like, no, he was fine. I think they're both willing to take whatever comes with it because they, they know that that's kind of the final gift that they can give him. Because yeah. I think even though he does have that moment where he gets cold feet near the end, he literally is in the cold getting cold feet about what he has to do. Yeah. And so he tries to flee. Like, I get that. And the thing is, they get that as characters. They're pissed at him. They tackle him. They do beat him. But they also know that he, why he's doing it. It's interesting that they don't feel welcome in, in inside places unless it's it's not civilian life. Like they yeah. don't go into the house; they go in a hotel room, but they paid for it. But every time they're they looking at that restaurant, but they want to place a booth like off the beaten path. Yeah, yeah. almost like they don't feel comfortable being out, even though they're military. Mm -hmm. I think that was a fascinating, kind of interesting way to write it. That even when they're at the mom's house and like we can wait inside, like no, let's not do that. Yeah. Um, they go into that place where it's that cult kind of a thing, and they're like, they stay away. They're behind they the beads. <laughs> yeah, they keep their distance from it. So everywhere they kind of were, it could be like a residential housing facility. They just don't feel natural. Even in a bar, they don't spend a lot of time there. Yeah, and it goes to that kind of treatment of how we treat our, our you know military people, our people in, in fatigue and such, is that they were kind of looked down upon. They were kind of seen as separate from society, and yet we glorified them in the public setting as like they are doing this great thing yeah. but then in private moments well we don't really want to be reminded of what they're sacrificing or what they're going through yeah it's interesting that they spend their last time together outside in the park and it's winter yeah <laughs> cooking hot dogs without buns cooking hot how dogs. many of you on July 4th had that huh <laughs> yeah. so overall I think it's one of Robert Town's 
best achievements for writing is mm -hmm. not his most celebrated, but if you think you want to write characters, you have to know characters. And this one is, he knows characters and knows how to write them. Yeah, because the, the movie toes an interesting line of being kind of funny, kind of dramatic, kind of serious, but never really any one of those things too much. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a really nice right. multi-genre kind of experience that leaves you on, on your feet then because you don't really, like, usually when you go to a comedy, you're almost, you're almost prepped to laugh. You know, you go to a scary movie and you get kind of that, like, roller coaster feeling. When you go to a movie like this, you can't really expect what's going to come next. Yeah. And I think that's really nice. Fun fact, the movie does kind of have a pseudo-sequel. Um, just a couple of years ago, Richard Linklater wrote and directed a film called Last Flag Flying, which is actually based on the sequel novel to oh, The Last Detail. Oh, right, because it's um, based on the book. Yeah, yeah so the, but the character names are changed. So you've got Steve Carell, Brian Cranston, and Larry Fishburne in that movie, and they're playing variations on what these characters would have been. Interesting. But they, did, they changed the, the names, basically, because the time period was going to be updated to the, a different war. Uh, but there is kind of a spiritual successor in some ways to Last Detail. Um, if any of you are available to find this, I looked all over the place on the internet and I could not find it, but when the film tanked at the box office, the yeah, studio tried to re-release it, marketing it as one of the most outlandish comedies that you could possibly watch. They really tried to sell this thing as like the next hit comedy again. I couldn't find one of these release posters or one of these trailers where they tried to sell the movie on re-release, but right. if you have a link to one, please put it down in the comments section. Yeah. I would love to see somebody try and sell this as a straight goofball comedy. It's not. <laughs> it's not at no. all. No. So that's the assessment. Uh, keep the conversation going. Like he said, uh, put a comment down below and tell your friends about the show. Yeah. Give us your favorite Robert Town written screenplays. We'll probably cover another one sure. on the show. Maybe even... Mission Impossible 2? No. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Kyle and Nick on Film. You can find all of my film reviews over at GoatFilmReviews.com. And I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Bye. E. Bravo. <laughs>